excited. So uh, my name is Dan Gilbarg. I teach sociology at BCC at the New Bedford campus. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Multicultural Committee, which puts on a program of educational events that goes all year long. And one of the uh, topics that we try to address every year is immigration. We try to look at issues where where we have structured inequalities in our society and where groups become stereotyped or demonized sometimes by the people that run our society in order to divide us. And immigration is definitely one of those issues. And we have three speakers today that will be able to lend some insight into, into this particular issue. One is Corinne Williams, who pulled this program together. She is director of Community Economic Development Center in New Bedford, based out in New Bedford. Uh, the second is Peter Knowlton, who is the district president and regional organizer for United Electrical Workers. And the third is Victor Manuel Salas Montenegro, who is from Mexico. He's a trade union leader, and he's here for three months, and a special treat for us to be able to share his experiences. So I'd like to introduce first um, Peter Knowlton, and then um, Victor will speak, and then Corinne. Uh, there will be time for questions. Uh, this will be going to a quarter to 11, so don't feel nervous about getting to your next class. Okay, so let's get started. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Knowlton, as Dan said. Hi, Marlene. Hi, Brian. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Good. Um, so I've been a trade union organizer for the last 30 years. Uh, I'm from this area, New Bedford, Dartmouth area. I live in Dartmouth. Um, much of, I guess you guys are my kids' age. Um, it's always hard to, it's like, Wow, you guys are my kids' age. Uh, so talk to your parents. After we have this talk today and this discussion, talk to your parents about what's happened in this neck of the woods in New Bedford over the last 25 years. Um, because New Bedford, for your, your parents will know this, got completely deindustrialized. Manufacturing basically got wiped out between the mid-80s and the mid-90s in this city. Uh, 10 to 15,000 of the highest paid manufacturing jobs, all union jobs, were either just shut down or they were outsourced to Mexico or to China or they went down south, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. Um, so the devastation for those people who, you know, talk bad about New Bedford because, oh, you know, it's a pit in the southeast of Massachusetts. The reason was is because the huge loss of jobs that this community faced. 10 to 15,000 jobs. We have a population here of 90 to 100,000 people. Um, so, and what have all those jobs been replaced with? $8 an hour jobs, no benefits. Uh, 20 years ago, these jobs were 15 to, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 dollars an hour, a full benefit package, pensions, health insurance, vacations, holidays, all that was destroyed. This is the reason why Wall Street's being occupied. It's the reason why Boston, the financial district, is being occupied. It's why that movement is happening. Of we're the 99 percent, and we're going to start standing up for our rights as the 99 percent because for the last 20 years, the 1 percent are the ones that have been calling the shots. But what we're really here about is to talk about NAFTA. Um, that's why, that's one of the reasons why Victor is up here for three months. It's why my union has a relationship with his union in Mexico. And it is also why uh, the issue of immigration has become such a driving force in this country in terms of a discussion point uh, with a lot of Americans just wondering why it is that all of a sudden millions of people from Mexico are coming north. Um, there's always been that migration, but it's been a fairly recent. And we would maintain it's because of NAFTA. That's one of the reasons why there's been a huge influx of people from Mexico north into the United States has been because of NAFTA. What we'd like to do first is we'd like to show a video. It's 10 minutes long. Um, it's by an organization called The Real News, uh, which is on the web. It's uh, just Real News. If you search in Real News, you get some very good documentaries, very good news reports on stuff that you don't see on CNN, on Fox, on ABC, CBS, and NBC. So we'll just do that first. It'll just sort of lay the context for you uh, about NAFTA and about what everybody, let me ask a question first. How many people here don't know what NAFTA is? Okay, NAFTA is a free trade agreement between Canada, the US, and Mexico that allows for the free flow of goods as if it was the same country. No excise tax. There's no taxes when I go to Can uh, Canada or I go to Mexico now with my products and I want to sell them. A lot of those taxes got disappeared. It was to the advantage, you will see, but is basically is a free trade agreement. It was the first one 
uh, that was really passed under the Clinton administration in 1993. So we'll start. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, coming to you from Tufts University in Boston. In the recent U.S. midterm elections, one of the hot button issues in many parts of the country was the issue of undocumented workers, some people call illegal immigrants. What effect does it have when people, because of their status, are willing to work for sometimes even below minimum wage? But the question that rarely gets asked in this debate is why are so many people from south of the border here? And what happened to the economies of countries like Mexico? And did, in fact, U.S. policy have something to do with it? Now joining us to talk about that question is Timothy Wise. He's director of the Research and Policy Program at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University in Boston. So why, why do so many people head north looking for work? Well, Paul, as I think it's pretty well known now, the, uh, the economies of uh, some of our main trading partners, such as Mexico, have not fared as well as people had hoped under uh, trade agreements like the North American Free Trade Agreement, now 16 years um, in operation. The job creation that took place in Mexico under that model, as we showed in a recent uh, Carnegie Endowment report, was disappointing to say the least, and most economists recognize that. Now, we were, we were told that the, the thing holding Mexico back was too much government public ownership, too much government regulation, so free up the economy, get the government out of the way, and productivity would go up and prosperity, especially with Mexico having so much oil, there would be great prosperity and that would be the, the solution to the Mexican economy's problems. No, beyond that, they, they promised, the promise of NAFTA was that Mexico would be able to export goods and not people. That was the explicit promise at the time of NAFTA and it just hasn't been true. Manufacturing, which saw huge growth in the initial years of NAFTA, actually generated very few jobs because uh, it destroyed as many almost as many manufacturing jobs as it created. How? Oh. And well, by by foreign companies coming in and out competing or buying up or um, or uh, bringing their products in and putting local firms out of business. So that put that lost jobs, and then the new firms that came in um, created some new jobs. But my area is agriculture, and that's the area where um, even if there have been small small gains in employment and manufacturing and in the service sector. The agricultural sector has just been decimated. NAFTA liberalized trade, which allowed uh, U.S. goods, mainly meats and grains, to flow um, without tariff, inter tariff uh, protection into Mexico and compete directly with uh, pr uh, producers who are producing things like corn, not just for the big global marketplace, but for their own consumption. So uh, tell us the story. Of Let me just really quickly. Does everybody here understand what a tariff is? How many people don't understand what a tariff is? Okay. Tariff is a tax that, a comp that you pay to sell your products in another country. So that's what NAFTA did, took away those taxes, those tariffs. Corn, how did that, what's the mechanism of that and, and what were the consequences? Sadly, the um, NAFTA included a transition period for the liberalization of corn that the Mexican government unilaterally chose not to follow. So corn tariffs, which the Mexican government had used fairly consistently to protect their corn farmers from cheaper corn coming from the U.S., um, were eliminated very quickly after NAFTA, within two years of NAFTA. Corn flooded in, its it, imports increased over 400% um, in Mexico of U.S. corn. Uh, prices went down 66% in, in the 16 years of, Na uh, of NAFTA, and um, the impact on Mexican producers was obviously devastating. Because the argument would be, what's wrong with cheaper food in Mexico? Well, cheaper food in Mexico is, is, is fine if that's translating into cheaper food. The only evidence that there's really been cheaper food in Mexico from that policy is that since it's mainly fed to animals, that pork might have gotten a little cheaper for some of urban consumers. But tortillas didn't get cheaper, um, which is the staple of the Mexican diet. And of course, the farmers who eat what they grow in addition to selling what they grow um, were devastated. The evidence is that 2.3 million people left agriculture um, in, in Mexico uh, in the time since NAFTA. And that, that actually hides um, an even worse story. Some, some five million um, uh, so-called unpaid family farm members um, left, the, left the farm. They didn't give up their farms, because their farms are a really valuable asset, often the only asset they have. But that's the flow 
that got pushed into the uh, into the undocumented migrant stream. Uh, those five million people who couldn't make a living off their family farms anymore. Now I, I remember in 1991 I stood on the uh, Tijuana border uh, on the Mexican side, looking north. Uh, it was about five or six o'clock in the evening, and there were about 300 people lined up on this side of me, another 300 lined up on this side of me. People were selling popcorn and candy and tortillas, and it was like a festival waiting for the sun to go down, where something close to, I think, a thousand people were all going to just go ahead into California. And waiting on the other side to stop them was nobody. Uh, so talk about the role of uh, the extent to which this people were not just forced north because of a destroyed agriculture in Mexico, but more or less welcomed to come north, even though supposedly it was illegal. Well, I think that uh, that's obviously a policy that um, in, in the beginning there was a more routine and regular and almost um, wink wink accepted um, policy of illegal but tolerated migration. Um, that changed significantly over the course of the NAFTA period, and particularly um, uh, after 9-11, when security concerns became paramount and securing the borders became the order of the day. The militarization of the border since then has resulted in, in making that journey much, much more perilous, much more cracked down on. Um, and, uh, you know, the deaths along the border reach record proportions every year. But, but, but hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that came during the more laissez-faire period were virtually invited to come, and in all, to all real intents and purposes, and have been working here for decades. And now there's a conversation about because they're not documented, they should be thrown out. I mean, it, it, it boggles the mind that people don't get why and how people are here. Well, right, and, it, and in Mexico it of course boggles the mind that every trade and everything was liberalized. The flow of goods, the flow of services, the flow of capital, but not the flow of people. It's the only thing that wasn't liberalized. And, and with the failure of job creation in Mexico, uh, particularly uh, the devastation in agriculture, um, the flow happened anyway. It happened, uh, we criminalized it, uh, criminal, and, and began to, to make that a much more, take a much more punitive approach to that on the part of the U.S. government. Um, with huge cost to human life, just the deaths on the border, um, to breaking up families, it used to be that with a seasonal flow of migrants, fam family members would come work in the, in, the, in the fields in California or wherever and go back home. Now families are permanently broken up because it's too risky to go back and forth and back and forth. They come and they stay. Um, it's too risky to bring their family members. So it's devastating to families as well. So talk a little bit about a particular company that seems to be on play both sides of the border and done fairly well, Smithfield, which is the, one of the largest pork producers and brings us lovely pork sausages and swine flew to boot. How does this mechanism help them? I was asked one. This company, the Tar Hill plant in North Carolina, uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers spent five years trying to organize this plant. Uh, the company filed a lawsuit, actually, against Jobs with Justice, which is a pro-community uh, worker organization out of Boston. It's actually it's a national organization, saying that they were uh, extorting Smithfield by running a community campaign of people not buying and boycotting Smithfield products. Bacon, sausages, um, other pork products in stop and shops. And the corporation tried to file a lawsuit under RICO, which is a criminal act that they were conspiring to uh, get consumers to boycott their products. There was no conspiracy. It was a public campaign. Um, but this is the kind of uh, companies that support NAFTA and some of the ones that are benefiting from it. So at a conference, well, if the far if farmers in the U.S. and farmers there don't win from NAFTA, who does? Take Smithfield, please. They benefit not only from U.S. agricultural policies, um, but from labor policies, environment policies, immigration policies, um, and trade policies. Obviously, NAFTA opened the border to their pork so they could sell their pork cheap in the United in in Mexico, and they did. Pork import pork exports increased 700 percent from the United States to Mexico. But they were getting all their feed grains cheap at a discount rate because of U.S. agricultural policies, which created overproduction and forced down corn and soy costs. So that's 65% of your operating costs if you're uh, fattening hogs. And so they were getting cheap feed for their hogs. They ex NAFTA liberalizes investment so they can invest their own capital to expand their operations in Mexico, and they become 
what is now the biggest pork producer in Mexico on uh, plants like that one in, in Veracruz that is suspected of having uh, some relationship to the swine flu epidemic. What are they feeding their hogs down there? They're feeding the imports of corn and soy um, that come in liberalized under NAFTA and come in below the cost of production. So again, it's a subsidy, to an implicit subsidy to Smithfield down there. Um, no environmental regulations are enforced either in the United States or in, um, in Mexico for these very polluting industrial hog operations. And then, as if that's not enough, um, all the people pushed out of jobs in Mexico in corn, in soy, in pork, all those small-scale producers who can't compete with, uh, with the imports or with Smithfield directly, need to look for work. And where do they find work? Well, some of them find them at the Veracruz facility in, in Mexico of Smithfield, and some of them come across the border and work at the Tar Heel plant in, in, uh, in North Carolina. Smithfield plant. The Smithfield plant. And with a lax enforcement of labor laws um, is yet another um, way that, that policy supports um, this kind of playing off, what amounts to, in, in the case of Smithfield and in the U.S., a playing off of uh, immigrant workers against uh, workers born here, undocumented immigrants against documented immigrants, and that stalled a unionization effort at, at the Tar Heel plant for years. Fortunately, their persistence and a massive corporate campaign led to a union victory there um, in 2008, or a historic union victory. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. little different perspective. Is that a little different than what you guys thought? Maybe wise people. How many people knew that was the reason why so, so many people from Mexico were coming north? Kind of the, uh, more, probably one of, one might, might have been one of the most underreported stories and continues to be over the last 20 years. My union, uh, the UE, United Electrical Radio Machine Workers, we were one of the largest unions in New Bedford uh, in uh, probably from the 40s until the 80s. And then we lost 2,500 members within a period of seven years, all due to plant closings. A bunch, not so much directly related to NAFTA, because most of the plant closings happened before NAFTA. Uh, but it was those kind of trade policies where a company can just threaten you, close down a factory, and move it someplace else, just so that they can put a little bit more money in their back pocket and not pay a price for those movement of jobs. But. What's happened in this country since NAFTA, my union knew if we did not develop a relationship with another union in Mexico that opposed NAFTA, we would be in trouble. And that for our perspective, in order for our members to be secure and to be protected and be defended and to have a decent life in America, we have to make sure as a result of the free trade agreement that we work with unions in Mexico to raise up the standard of living of Mexican workers. Because the biggest threat to your pay is your neighbor if they're getting paid half to a tenth of what you make. Um, and we allow that competition to happen on wages. No more longer is it competition based on quality or what you make or whether or not the product is useful. It's now just based on how cheaper, how much cheaper can I pay people so that I can put more money into my back pocket the back pocket of the shareholders, and the back pockets of the board of directors. That's really what the competition has been about. And when you compete over wages, it doesn't matter in today's times whether the competition is between Massachusetts or Rhode Island, Massachusetts or Mexico, Massachusetts or China. Because of the, because of the computers and the ability of, to transport goods quickly, cheaply, uh, and somewhat safely, uh, and somewhat cheaply, is that now the competition is on a global basis. It's no for wage for lowering the wages. It's no longer just on a regional basis. So it used to be the threat to us in Massachusetts was product moving to North Carolina, to South Carolina, to Georgia. That's the way it was in the 1800s and early 1900s. Now the threat is cheaper wages elsewhere around the world. Right? So our goal is not to have it so we make less in the United States. As workers, that's not our goal. Our goal is we need to raise up those people who's, uh, who are being exploited by US companies. Um, I'm going to stop there and have Victor talk about 
uh, what's going on in Mexico, uh, the conditions they face in Mexico. Uh, and then I figure uh, Karim is going to talk about what the newest immigrants face in New Bedford and have faced for the last, well, hundred so years, right? It's always the newest immigrants are the ones that have the hardest time uh, when they come here because there isn't the infrastructure set up. Uh, and the CEDC has been one of the preeminent organizations in Southeastern Mass that's been around to protect and defend and help the newest immigrants into our country. Um, but Victor, if, uh, the one thing that I want to say before Victor comes up is just understand Victor is a wastewater treatment operator. He does the kind of work that people in the South End do, where the wastewater treatment plant is in Fort Tabor. How much do you think an hour those folks make at Fort Tabor? What do you think the average wage is? $30. Any ideas? $30 an hour. $15. Probably $15. Uh, well, on the low end, maybe it's a higher rate, upwards of $30 an hour. Victor is a wastewater treatment operator in Mexico in his factory that makes pistons, it's called Mali, makes pistons and piston rings and assemblies for auto parts, $2 an hour. Victor makes $2 an hour. Uh, and many factory workers in Mexico make $2 a day. It is not unusual to make $2 a day in Mexico. So the, this is what is driving Mexican people north. But I think we would all agree, if we had our choice, we would rather stay where we're born. We don't want to move if we don't have to. We would rather stay where we're born. So it's our job, right, as working people and as trade unions to make, give us that ability to stay where we're born by giving us decent wages and a good standard of living. Victor, you want to see? I'll grab a chair. I'm going to. Uh, or, or. Uh, okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Bueno, ya Peter dijo lo que yo iba a decir al inicio, dónde trabajo, cuánto es lo que gano, y, por, y esa es la razón por la que muchas empresas de Estados Unidos van hacia México. Well, Peter um, stole my thunder a little bit because I was going to share with you about how much I made, uh, how much I make per hour, and one of the reasons why um, there is this um, uh, flight of jobs um, to, from the United States to Mexico. Sí, me sorprende la cantidad de dinero que gana un operario en Estados Unidos haciendo lo mismo que yo hago en México. I was very surprised to hear about how much um, uh, a worker does the same job that I do is earning here in the United States. Entonces, vamos a iniciar un poco dando a conocer cómo era México antes del Tratado de Libre Comercio. So let's start off by understanding um, what life was like before the NAFTA treaty was put into place. México tenía una economía cerrada. Uh, Mexico had a closed economy. Donde solo se consumía lo que se producía en el país. And it was a, an economy where they uh, consumed whatever they produced within the country. Los productos americanos cuando llegaban a México eran eran de una manera contrabandeada. Um, American products that would come into Mexico would be considered like contraband. Los aranceles eran muy caros, los, los impuestos eran muy caros, por eso las mercancías no podían tener ese libre flujo hacia México. Um, the, the, um, the tariffs and the, the taxes uh, for American products were very, very high, and so that's why um, you didn't have that flow of goods coming from the United States into Mexico. Es por eso que los empresarios mexicanos tenían garantizado el consumo de sus productos en México. And that's why um, uh, Mexican companies had sort of a guaranteed market for the products that they were producing within Mexico. Esto hizo que los empresarios mexicanos no se preocuparan por crear nuevas tecnologías. And um, that's the reason why um, Mexican um, enterprises um, didn't worry about the technology that they were, were developing. Cuando se abre la frontera con el Tratado de Libre Comercio. When the uh, border was opened up with NAFTA. Y los productos americanos pueden entrar sin el pago de aranceles tan altos. 
and when products began to flow into into Mexico um, without tariffs and, and taxes. Muchos de los empresarios mexicanos empezaron a cerrar sus empresas porque ya no eran competitivas. Uh, and then a lot of the, the companies in Mexico began to shut down because they couldn't compete with the American products. El lema para abrir el Tratado de Libre Comercio en México era más y mejores empleos. Con eso trataron de convencernos a nosotros. Um, so what we were told is that NAFTA would bring more and better jobs. That's what, what was um, represented to us. Entonces, imagínense peleando dos economías en un mismo plano, la americana y la mexicana, ¿sí? donde los americanos tienen toda la tecnología y los mexicanos están abajo en esa tecnología. Yeah, imagine what it's like for two economies to be competing against one another, where one economy has all the technology and, um, and the other doesn't have that advantage. Las maquiladoras es algo que inició por ahí de los 60s, más o menos. Uh, beginning in, in like the 1960s, um, the maquiladora system began. Pero cuando se abre el Tratado de Libre Comercio, aprovechan para ir por las condiciones 10 veces más barato producir sus mismos productos que en Estados Unidos. And, um, but when NAFTA came around, that became a, a, a way of taking more advantage of cheap labor um, across the border. Ah, bueno, la, la maquiladora son las, las mismas empresas de Estados Unidos que van a México, pero este, obviamente pagando menos. Eh, bueno, el gobierno mexicano ofreció a los empresarios americanos eh, terreno gratis, uh -huh. no pago de impuestos, o sea, no tenían que pagar impuestos durante 10 años, ellos querían, todos los servicios gratis. So, what was um, called this maquiladora are the factories that were producing in the United States, but the Mexican government gave free land, tax breaks, and the ability to open up new enterprises across the border. Ahí se dio una migración interna del país de México, del, del sureste de México hacia el norte porque las maquiladoras se instalaron en la franja, en la frontera de Estados Unidos México. And, um, and, and when these maquiladoras were set up and built, that created um, a massive internal immigration, internal migration of Mexicans that started to migrate to these jobs up at the border region where the factories were set up. Imagínense en el sector de agricultura. Uh, imagine in the agricultural sector donde en Estados Unidos se tiene un tractor y medio por cada agricultor. Uh, in the United States there's a, there's a tractor and a half for every farmer. Y en México se tiene un tractor por cada 100 agricultores. And in Mexico there's only one tractor per every hundred farmers. Nos devastaron. So uh, there's a, um, there's no comparison. Porque es muy difícil poder competir con esa tecnología. So you can't compete with the technology. Los campesinos empiezan a emigrar hacia las ciudades. And so peasants started to um, immigrate toward the cities. Y es por eso la migración también hacia Estados Unidos. And then as a, as a next step um, to find work and to immigrate to um, the United States. Y a veintitantos años del NAFTA, and after 20 some odd years after NAFTA, seguimos esperando los mejores, los más y mejores empleos. We keep waiting for the, the better and, and greater number of jobs. En el 97, durante la recesión económica, in 1997, during the um, economic recession in Mexico, la manera del gobierno de poder subsanar esa situación fue llevando más maquiladoras hacia el interior del país. Uh, the, the way that the Mexican government was coping with that economic crisis was to create even more of these maquiladoras um, in, la frontera, in, in, la the, in the border region. No, hacia el interior. Oh, oh, now, now in the rest of the country. El 
hubo estabilidad en ese momento con esa medida. And at that point, that measure created some some um, stability in the economy. Pero en el 2000, but en el año 2000, in uh, the year 2000, se da un nuevo fenómeno. There was a new phenomenon that came about. El 70, 80% de esas maquiladoras que habían contribuido a la estabilidad del país. So 70 to 80 percent of those maquiladoras that contributed to the stability of the country. Se fueron a China. They left to go to China. Donde es 10 veces más barato que en México. Where it's 10 times cheaper for labor than Mexico. Actualmente la cifra de desempleo en el país, en México. Um, the the um, unemployment rate in Mexico. La cifra oficial. The official unemployment rate in, in Mexico. Son dos millones quinientos mil personas. Um, there it's two hundred fifty thousand people who are out of out of work. Pero esa es la cifra oficial. But that's the official unemployment rate. El organismo encargado de, de de estar eh, monitoreando esta situación, el INEGI. Uh, the, the government agency that monitors those labor statistics. Si tú vendes una bolsa de paletas en un mes, ellos te consideran empleado. If you're selling, uh, <coughs> you're selling a bag of popsicles uh, once a month, then you're considered employed. Puedes este, en un semáforo limpiar un vidrio que te den 20 pesos y el INEGI te considera trabajador. And if you you're uh, a person that washes windows at a stop, uh, you know, a, a, an intersection, you're considered employed. Actualmente el sector informal de trabajadores, es decir, aquellos que no pagan impuestos, que venden chucherías, todo eso, ya es mayor que el sector formal, aquellos que pagan sus impuestos, que tienen su seguro social y todo ese tipo de prestaciones. So at this point, um, what's considered the informal sector, those folks who are not paying taxes, people who are selling snacks and gum on the street, um, is much larger than the actual formal economic sector of people who are paying their taxes and have a formal job. Mucho de este, de este desempleo impacta a los jóvenes que no tienen este, al alcance un trabajo. And um, uh, this um, um, unemployment issue has a big effect on young people because there's many young people who can't find jobs. Esta condición es aprovechada por los carteles de la droga en México. And those are the, the reasons why the drug cartels take advantage of young people in Mexico. Un cartel le paga a un joven 18 mil pesos al mes solo por estar en un crucero avisándoles a qué horas pasa la policía o el ejército. Um, and the drug cartels would take advantage of, of young people and pay them... Um, 18,000, son como $1,500. About $1,500 to a young person to act as a lookout for the cops or for um, la policía, ¿qué más? Y el ejército. And the army for the police and the army to just be a lookout. Solo por estar observando. Eh, es, eh, esta condición de los jóvenes. Uh, this, uh, uh, this problem of young people. Hace que ellos acepten el trabajo. And because they can't find work is, is why they end up going into um, um, working with the drug cartels. Aunque el promedio de vida para alguien que ingresa un cartel es de tres meses. Um, but the average time that people are working with the, the drug cartels is only about three months. They only last about three months. Es por eso que ahora en México tenemos 50 mil muertos en los últimos cuatro años. And that's why there's been 50,000 people that have been killed um, in the last four years. Es peor que lo que se vive en Irak o en, o en países que están en guerra. Nosotros no estamos en guerra, pero tenemos más muertos que países que tienen guerra. And this is more than what has has occurred in the Iraq War or in countries that are are in, are um, you know at war. Y tenemos eh, la media poblacional es 
60 millones de pobres que viven con menos de 2 dólares al día. And um, we have a poverty rate of, um, or individuals who are, uh, are living in poverty, 60,000 60, people who are living on less than $2 a day. Y la cuestión sindical. And regarding the unions. Solamente el 5% de los trabajadores mexicanos tiene sindical. Only 5% of the workforce um, have union membership, are part of a union. De este 5%. Of, of that 5%. El 90% está controlado por el sindicato del gobierno, que es la CTM. Um, of, of that 5%, 90% belong to the government union, the CTM. Solamente el 10% de ese 5% tiene sindicatos auténticos. Uh, only 10% of, of that 5% are, belong to authentic and real unions. Actualmente tenemos una dura pelea con el gobierno mexicano, los sindicatos independientes. So that's why the independent unions have a really tough fight with the Mexican government. Porque aún con las condiciones que hay de, de bajo salario y no prestaciones, el gobierno quiere modificar la ley federal laboral. And even though um, we don't enjoy um, uh, good salaries or benefits, the Mexican government wants to change the, um, uh, change the law. Para darle más beneficios a los patrones. To give more benefits to the, to the bosses. Quieren legalizar el outsourcing porque en México no es legal el outsourcing. Um, at this point, they want to legalize outsourcing, and at this point, it's not legal to um, outsource. Quieren hacer el pago por horas. They want to institute a, <coughs> por, a, a, a per hour system of pay. Que significa que el, el patrón solo le va a permitir al trabajador que trabaje, que labore cuando él tenga trabajo. Cuando no tiene, lo regresa a su casa. And so in that case, that means when you're working by the hour, um, your boss can send you home when there's no work. Contratos temporales para que la gente no tenga una antigüedad en su trabajo. And um, so it's, it's like working on a temporary shift so there's no security in your job. Eliminar el derecho de crear nuevos sindicatos. And also the, um, the right to organize new unions. Esa es la situación actual en México. Tenemos, ya hemos hecho tres concentraciones masivas en este año. Um, that, this is what the situation is in Mexico, but we've done three uh, major um, mobilizations, demonstrations um, so far. Porque no, que, no queremos permitir que esa ley se aplique ahora en México. Um, because we don't want that, lay, uh, that law to pass in Mexico. So we've been fighting against that law. Nosotros eh, como sindicato tuvimos un caso curioso. Um, in our case, as a, um, as a union, we have a, a very interesting case. Demandamos la titularidad de contrato, porque en México tienes que demandar a la empresa por el contrato, para un nuevo contrato en una empresa japonesa. Um, we actually sued our company um, on our contract because they wanted to um, They wanted to uh, ins install a, a Japanese-based company, so we sued against the the, um, the Mexicans. Todos los el el proceso mm -hmm. eh, en en México para que tú puedas sindicalizar a una empresa. In order to organize a company, this is getting a little, you know, <laughs> a little bogged down in, in 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 the technical aspect. But in in Mexico, when you organize a union. Tú tienes que demandar como sindicato uh, a la empresa. You have to like put a claim, like a, a suit against your company. Para tener el contrato de esos trabajadores. To, to be able to win a contract for those workers. La, la mesa de conciliación tiene que proponer una fecha para un, un voto secreto. Um, so the, um, uh, the, the government has to um, It's a board of conciliation 
they have to set the date for the um, the union election. Y la gente es la que decide qué sindicato se queda en esa empresa. And so that's when the workers decide whether or not they're going to keep the union in the company. Cuando nosotros hicimos eso, and when we did, we did that, el mayor obstáculo fue el gobierno. And the biggest obstacle to us was the government. Hicieron toda una estrategia junto con la empresa. They uh, teamed up with the company and, and, and created a strategy. No nos dejaron entrar para el recuento. Para la votación secreta. And they didn't even let us um, go in uh, to be able to count the votes. Y cuando quisimos llevar esto a una instancia más alta en el gobierno. And when we tried to bring it up to a higher level of the government. La respuesta que recibimos fue. Uh, our, the response from the government was. Con las empresas japonesas no se meten. That don't, don't mess with the Japanese um, companies. Porque en el estado donde yo vivo, in uh, the uh, region where I live, in the state where I live, el 80% de la inversión es japonesa. 80% of, of investment comes from Japanese firms. La amenaza de los japoneses fue, si el, si el FAT entra en esta empresa, la inversión japonesa se va del país, del estado. And so the Japanese firms made a threat that if if the FAT, their union, goes into this company, then the Japanese will pull out of, um, of Mexico, pues, pull out their investment. Es muy difícil porque tenemos que pelear contra el sistema corporativo y el de bien. So it's, it's, it's difficult because we have to fight against the, uh, the corporate system, but also against our own government. La relación que tenemos con la UI aquí en Estados Unidos the relationship that we have with the UE here in the United States nos permitió demandar una empresa en el estado de México que tiene una filial en Estados Unidos y esa filial en Estados Unidos está controlada por la UE. Um, so uh, because of our our tie with the UE, we were uh, we were able to put this suit against the company in Mexico because the UE had an affiliation with a shop or a company in the United States. Tuvieron que ir líderes sindicales de la empresa en Estados Unidos a la empresa que tenemos en México. Tuvieron que ir líderes sindicales de la UI, de la empresa que está en Estados Unidos, a la que tenemos en México. Yeah, so we we had a tie between the leadership in the UE in the United States and the, and the leadership of the union here in, in Mexico. Y después de cuatro años de estar en pleito, and after four years of fighting, parece que todo se está dando a favor de un sindicato independiente. We now um, think that that things are on our side to favor um, favor our, our independent union. Es por eso la relación tan importante que tenemos con UE. And that's why our relationship, <coughs> our tie to UE, is so important to us. Y estamos en la pelea. And we continue to fight. Before you start, I just yeah. want to mention uh, we have an evaluation form here. Uh, pass it around. Please fill it out before you leave, and pass it out. Pass it in as you as you leave. Okay. Um, well, anyway, uh, I know that the president of Mexico is this guy named Calderon. Damn, you stand right in front of me. Oh, damn, you stand right. In front of me. <laughs> you go that way. Okay. Anyway, and that the election was very. I forget the guy that was running against him. What was his name? Obrador. Huh? Lopez Obrador. Lopez Obrador. Obrador. Yes, and there was a very close election, and there was charges of fraud and everything. Would the other guy have been better for the Mexican people? And that's question number one. And question number two, did the United States do anything to influence that election so that Calderon would win and therefore uh, help the U.S. corporations rather than... The other guy helping the Mexican people. La primera, la primera, si fuera mejor o cobrador para los trabajadores en México. Y la segunda es si hubo fraude y todo eso, y si hubo influencia de Estados Unidos en la elección. La manera como López Obrador 
este, ganó eh, el apoyo de la gente? Uh, no, bueno, en su, en su campaña. Ah, oh, ok. Cuando él estaba en campaña. Uh -huh. And um, Obrador had a lot of support from people during his campaign. Uh -huh. Porque sus propuestas estaban en el recorte de salarios al sistema burocrático, la gente que trabaja para el gobierno. Uh, so part of his campaign featured um, budget cuts to um, government workers. That was a, you know, part of the... Él, él decía que para poder hacer lo que él pretendía tenía que obtener recursos y era recortar los salarios porque los salarios en México de los, de, 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 de los funcionarios es altísimo. So, um, his strategy for his, his economic proposals was to cut um, public workers uh, because the public workers earn a lot more in comparison with other, other workers. Pero son los funcionarios de alto nivel, no el servicio público. Not public service workers, but high functionaries, you know, high, high bureaucrats that were earning enormous salaries. Es, es una enorme diferencia la que hay entre el, los salarios que obtienen los funcionarios y el personal de abajo. Yeah, it's a huge difference between the, you know, the, the uh, fat cats and the, you know, regular workers. And so he was taking a position against NAFTA. Eh, sí, sí la tenía. Yes, he did. Yeah. Es por eso que él decía, bueno, eh, una de las situaciones por las que no ganó López Obrador One of the reasons why he didn't win es porque él no le agradaba a muchos americanos. Uh, because he didn't please a lot of the American interests. Él no tenía compromisos con gobiernos como el de Estados Unidos. Um, he didn't have commitments with the American government. Lo que se tiene Calderón. And like like uh, Calderón had. Compromisos con gobiernos americanos y españoles. Um, these, he, Calderón had uh, these commitments with the United States and, and Spain. ¿Qué clase de compromiso? Sí, eh, eh, por ejemplo, la, la ley federal modificarla para que es, es un compromiso que no tienen por ejemplo la en cuestiones de energía uh -huh. petróleos mexicanos da contratos a, a este a españoles a norteamericanos de hecho ahorita hay una situación de un contrato que se dio okay um, and so what he means by commitments were um, some of these treaties like around the um, the oil industry uh, that would give um, Um, give uh, uh, contracts with the United States and with Spain around the around the, uh, petroleum industry. So the other guy didn't have those those kind of commitments. Y acerca de si hubo fraude. And were you asking about whether or not there was um, fraud and uh, misconduct? Yeah, and also U.S. intervention, because a lot of times the United States will intervene in an election like that if they have a candidate that they like better, you know, somebody who's going to, you know, uh, sell out their own country for U.S. corporate interests versus somebody who's going to defend their own country against U.S. corporate interests. I mean, they've, they've been known to intervene in elections like that. So did they? The, Hubo intervención de los Estados Unidos eh, durante la elección, una influencia eh, de, de Estados Unidos, porque muchas veces pues, el gobierno de Estados Unidos se mete en elecciones en otros países para, para la influencia. Bueno, eh, eh, el, eh, vamos, no tenemos de una manera definida. Sabemos que entró porque el, el, la manera como ganó Calderón fue como ganó Bush su última elección por una diferencia mínima. Yeah, we well, that's louder because the vent is going. Yeah, yeah. We know that there there has been um, you know, mis, misconduct. It's almost like like the the win on the election was very minimal like with with the Bush election that, you know, between the two candidates. Entonces, en México todos sabemos que ganó López Obrador. La gente. Ajá. Sabemos que ganó la elección, pero el sistema nos dice que no. Uh -huh. Everybody seems, 
everybody knows that Obrador really won, but the system, you know, the system the way it is, is is how, you know, how how, how the election went. Es la segunda ocasión en la historia de México que le quitan el que le quitan el derecho a la izquierda a la izquierda de llegar al poder porque en 1986 sabemos que Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas que era parte de la izquierda mismo partido que López Obrador ganó también y le quitaron. Ya yeah, en la tercera segunda vez. Segunda. Ya yeah. and that's the second time that that's happened that a leftist candidate um, like in 1986 with Cárdenas that that they actually Rob the election from the candidate from coming to coming into office. Let me. Does everybody? Uh, let me ask a question. What would happen in your neighborhood if your neighbor burned down your house and then you went to live in their house? Because they burned down your house, so you went to live in their house. Right? Wouldn't that be a fair thing to do? Essentially, that is what we've done to Mexico. Economically. Through the free trade agreement. Because we've gone to Mexico, we've scorched their land, driven people off of the farms, into factories that pay $2 an hour for Victor, is high for a lot of factory workers in Mexico. He is a wastewater treatment operator. Like here, he is paid more money than other production workers. So our economic policy is, a, we call it scorched earth. You go in, you destroy the farms, you make it so that farmers cannot live. Five million farmers get driven off their land, get put into the Mercadores, where they can't make a living, where health and safety conditions are horrible. So they go north, because that's where the house is. That's where the good jobs are. Let me ask, I, w I just want to ask another question. How many people know about the European Union? How many people, uh, two people have heard about the European Union during the same time that NAFTA happened. Remember when Victor talked about there is one and a half tractors for every hundred farms in Mexico and there is one and a half tractors for every farm in the US? The situation was the same between Portugal and Spain and France and Germany. France and Germany probably had one tractor for every half farm. And France and Portugal, I mean Spain and Portugal were the poorest countries who had one and a half tractors for every 50 farms, every 100 farms. But what the European Union did is they took the money and they gave it to the poorest countries. They provided resources for the poorest countries so that they could get one and a half tractors or one tractor for every farm. They did not do that in Mexico. They did the opposite. They just threw people off the land. So if you go to the Azores now, and I've been going every year for the last 20 years, every other year for the last 20 years, you now see people who have been risen out of poverty in the last 20 years as a result of the European Union because the money from the rich countries went into the poor countries to lift them up. So now everybody has electricity, everybody has cable TV, there's no, for essentially, there's basically no poverty in the Azores or in Portugal. These are some of the poorest, poorest places that existed 20 years ago, where you had people coming from the Azores to the U.S. Now people are going back. But during the same time, we had a scorched earth policy in Mexico, which was run by the companies, right? There was another policy. There was another free trade policy in Europe to raise the poorest countries up. So I guess the question is, when everybody comes north from Mexico and Guatemala and El Salvador, why, would we, why should we be against them? We should be helping them. Why should we be raiding factories where they work, detaining them, which happened four years ago, and then sending them back to Texas? Shouldn't we be helping those people who come to our shores, who are the newest immigrants? And shouldn't we be reaching out and helping the people in Mexico be able to raise up their standard of livings to a level that is closer to ours so we don't have that problem of immigration and migration. What do you guys think? What can an average person like you, myself, and Victor do to help a situation like that? Like how can we help Mexico's economy or help America to see that, you know, these immigrants do need better lives? Like what can we do? 
What do you think? I honestly don't know. I think that America needs to intervene like, tremendously and, and do I'll something that's going to help them. <laughs> Let me ask a question. Do you think not allowing immigrant students to be treated like a resident of Massachusetts so they can't get public education, higher public education, do you think that's a good way? Does that help? No. But that's what the state passed. I think what was interesting in the, in the clip, um, what they talked about was that there was a period of time where, um, where basically people were able to kind of walk come over the border and um, and a lot of times like like Peter said this is kind of like you don't hear this side of, of things that you know constantly on if you turn on radio or or television they're always slamming immigrants it's always about illegal immigrants it's all about you know they're taking our jobs they're uh, they come here to go on welfare, this, that, and the other thing. But there was a period of time where employers were actually attracting a lot of immigrants to come into into work, um, and it happened a lot in the in in our area, especially um, in the on the waterfront and seafood processing um, companies along the waterfront, and later on other kinds of factories. So it was a wink and a nod where. Technically, there were employer sanctions that were in place where you, an employer was not allowed to hire someone who didn't have their social security, but it happened. It happened in large numbers of people. And what ended up happening? People ended up coming. There were job opportunities. And so other relatives started to come. And so families started to form. But only parts of families started to form. So in many ways, families are stuck between being in the United States and being across the border. Um, so we deal with that every day where families have been divided, where children have been left back home and yet want to come back and reunite with their parents who are living here. That we're not really um, providing enough of a, a solution about um, how to reunite families um, through um, changing our immigration laws. So one of the things that we're involved in at the CEDC is fighting for more just um, immigration reform, um, to, um, to look at policies that would change the, the fact that so many people have put roots down in the United States, have been living here, have been going to English classes, have been paying their taxes, but they haven't been allowed the opportunity to uh, change their status from being um, undocumented to, uh, to legal. Uh, and what happens when you hear this immigrant bashing that goes on on the radio and on television that, pe that, that like Dan said, immigrants are demonized. You know, they're, they're turned into like, like the cause of everything, you know, the cause of, of, of drugs and guns and welfare and, you know, on and on and on. There's like all, all these kinds of things that scapegoat immigrants. But the reality is, is that people that immigrants have been part of of our history for hundreds and hundreds of years um, what they were talking about with um, was what happened in a crisis in Mexican agriculture that ended up bringing um, Mexicans up north from across the border happened hundreds of years ago in Canada um, New Bedford is a is a community settled by many French Canadians that built <coughs> built St. Anthony's Church and filled the jobs in the mills. Well, they ended up migrating over the border from Canada to uh, New England to fill the mills. But it wasn't uh, you know it's it's not the same kind of rhetoric that you hear on TV all the time about crossing the border and breaking the law and and all of that. Our laws have changed over time, uh, but at, uh, and at the same time, over the years that we've been working at the CEDC with workers who are facing horrible conditions in workplaces that, imagine if, if you were coming from a situation in Central America or Mexico earning $2 a day and you're you get a job you're making eight dollars an hour what kind of difference is that going to make to your family that you're sending money home to so the conditions that you're putting up with year after year are unacceptable would be unacceptable to me would it be unacceptable to you 
about the kinds of health and safety violations that go on, the accidents, the pressure, um, and the abuse that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis in the factories that are, are, are right here in New Bedford. So there's plenty that we can do. Um, it's a willingness to to um, to want to help, to want to do something, uh, to make a difference. And there's lots of people in the community that are are um, creating those bridges and getting to know the immigrant community uh, to provide some some help. I wanted to say two things. One is everybody here is in a position where they can go out and vote. And so when you hear politicians talk about these issues, some of them are sympathetic to the issues that immigrants face trying to survive in our society, and others are attacking immigrants as a source of our problem, claiming that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our taxes, and so on, which is not true, by the way. There's more jobs created because of immigration, and more money comes in with taxes than paid out in services. But they're saying that, and that's an attempt to manipulate voters. So when you hear somebody talking that way immediately, based on what we've heard today, you should say, I'm not voting for that person, and I'm going to tell my friends not to vote for that person. Right? That's, an, that's something that we can do, hopefully, you know, that everyone can do. The other thing I was going to say is, going back to this issue of the role of the United States, and the example of, of Portugal and the Azores versus the European Union, I mean, in this country, the, our government has followed a policy of doing whatever our corporate elite wants. So whatever the big businesses that invest in Latin America, whether it be Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, or wherever, they're, they're going to defend their interests, which, which means that they want the labor to be as cheap as possible, the fewest health and safety regulations, and so on. Instead of recognizing that what's in the interest of the American people is to promote the standard of living in these communities, to have, have real rights, which means that people then, then it won't be a cheap labor thing that's drawing American jobs into those areas and we lose our jobs and also that people are not faced with these compelling situations where based on survival that they feel that they have to leave their country. It's a tragedy that anyone would be in that position to have to leave their country. It's a huge sacrifice and we should be promoting positive, better living standards because it's the right thing to do for that population and because it would be in our self-interest as, as, as a country. So I think that if we're aware of those things, we can then evaluate our governments and our policies and push for people to be in power that are, that are taking a positive stand rather than a negative stand. And there are people that are advocating at the national level for more positive immigration legislation. And there's people that are, used, are demonizing immigrants scapegoating them and trying to basically get votes at, at the expense of the American people. Yeah, and, and just to, you know, just to piggyback on the, the, the whole debate about immigration reform, it came up, it, it continues to come up in, in Congress and um, at a national level because that's the solution, right? I mean, I, I'm in different periods of time, there have been, there's been a realization like we can't go on like this, but there's a, a very vocal minority that, that is um, constantly with the drumbeat about, about immigrants taking our jobs and, and, and so on. But in any kind of, of um, polling that's gone on about whether or not you support that immigrants who are here um, to be given the opportunity to adjust their status and take a path to citizenship, to do the right thing, to you know, to pay their back taxes, to go to English classes, to integrate in, 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 into broader society, 63% of Americans think that that's a good idea. Um, but it's been, um, like I said, Congress that's, that's been um, holding that back and also a, a vocal minority that have been um, kind of hijacking the debate about the need for comprehensive immigration re reform. Well, I think time is up, so let's uh, uh, recognize our speakers. I have one final. I have one final ask, and that is Ken Pittman on Lo on 1420 is constantly on the radio bashing immigrants and bashing the organizations that support the newest immigrants in New Bedford. 
If you ever hear it, if you're home, if you're on your cell phone, call up and just say, I'm an immigrant, I just haven't come here recently. Or if you have, I've been here recently. This city was founded on immigrants. We gotta stop bashing them and just, I would just keep, he needs some counterpoint and he brings it up regular. So I please, just ask, that's one thing you can do. How many people here are Native American that can trace their roots to uh, Native, North American Indians background? Well then we all came here, except for African Americans who were forced to come here as slaves, we all came here from someplace else. And many people came here without papers, yep. illegally, quote unquote. So we have to, like Peter said, and, and like Dan said, the growth of our country is due to all the immigrants that came in. It's absolutely why we're the biggest, strongest country in the world. So. Thank you again.